Welcome to this week's Hydrogen Full Court Press interview, a weekly series where we dive deeper into the fascinating world of hydrogen with the ambition of accelerating the energy transition in the Middle East and worldwide. Uh, so we welcome experts and leaders who are working on seizing the tremendous opportunities that are around the development of hydrogen, uh, which will help countries worldwide and stakeholders reach the ambitious goals that are set for 2050, 2060, depending on where we're at. So today I am thrilled to welcome Mr. Yusuf Makun, managing, managing partner sorry, at Cranmore Partners. So good afternoon, Yusuf, and welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Hi, Leila. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Great. So to start this uh, interview, I wanted to talk about the opportunities of hydrogen that are happening right now across the world, whether it's in Europe to Japan to Australia, Egypt and the Middle East, all over the world. Um, everyone's talking about it and uh, the potential that it has. So I wanted to get your opening thoughts on where we're at today, uh, middle of the year 2022. Uh, a lot of geopolitical context happening with obviously the situation happening in Europe. Um, I just wanted to get your opening thoughts on where you think we're at in terms of accelerating the adoption of hydrogen. So from where we sit, we're in a transition period. We're no longer talking about concepts. Projects mm -hmm. are starting to uh, dig deeper into the realization. And uh, with that comes challenges, of course, because um, the reality on the ground, especially with supply chain uh, disruptions and hyperinflation on um, on um, raw materials, um, shortages on the um, contractor front are causing concerns. At the same time, we are in the middle of an energy crisis, let's call it as it is. Uh, that interestingly creates economic space as well, because gas price uh, is high, um, carbon price slightly lower, but still at quite healthy levels in Europe. And therefore, um, clean hydrogen as a substitute uh, for energy and therefore um, basically uh, being a mix of uh, carbon price plus, let's say, energy content price uh, is having a greater breathing space to, to reach um, uh, break even vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. conventional uh, sorts of energy plus avoided carbon price. Yeah. Uh, so I that that transition period, it's uh, slightly challenging as the reality is being discovered on projects. Um, it's a natural um, and necessary um, necessary process, I guess. Yeah, and you mentioned that obviously we're going through an energy crisis. So this idea of energy security versus energy transition is kind of come, keeps on coming back uh, to the table. So for a while after COP26, we saw that everyone was behind this energy transition. Stakeholders were putting and investors were putting the money behind the energy transition today we obviously have uh, a huge uh, energy security issue that's coming back um, so how do you see this balance between energy security versus energy transition and how do you see it affecting today um, the acceleration of uh, hydrogen initiatives hydrogen infrastructure etc we don't see any incompatibility between energy transition and energy security. In actual fact, we had published a uh, country investability index for hydrogen just before COP. And uh, in there, you will see out of six pillars, energy security being one. Um, why? Because obviously, vis-a-vis uh, -vis existing, let's say, low carbon uh, energy vectors, um, hydrogen brings clear complementarity. And therefore, hydrogen, when realized at scale, uh, will be a genuine energy security mitigant. Um, as such, we don't necessarily see the debate being contradictory between energy security and energy transition. Um, in the near term, there is an emergency, an urgency, right, to, to address the uh, energy shortfall, primary energy shortfall created potentially by uh, issues around geopolitics, especially in relation to Russia for gas supply. Um, that may lead to near-term disruption, uh, but hopefully in the medium to long term, uh, the equation, if anything, should favor energy transition towards away from fossil fuels and accelerate that. Now, the near-term imperatives and the additional GDP points, as it were, that will have to be allocated to energy um, and hope and 
whether or not this leads to uh, recessions or not may slightly disrupt the equation that we do recognize that remains to play out still um, we will watch that carefully yeah and i wanted to bring up this point of also hydrogen compared to other alternative or renewable energy sources how do you see uh, it is it taking the lead is it a bit behind compared to for example wind or solar how do you see uh, these different kind of renewable energies and different sources coming into the mix whether it's in the middle east or worldwide um, i want sure. to get your points on that no absolutely look um, the the renewable electron um, is crucial mm -hmm. um, and it will continue expanding hugely globally uh, it is easy to implement. By the way, it's also indispensable for production of green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, the point, though, is electrification can only go that far, um, and it should go as far as it can, mm -hmm. because renewable electricity, uh, together with decreasing costs of uh, storage, electricity storage, uh, um, should basically take over as much as possible of the um, existing electricity uses and be pushed as far as possible beyond. Now, there is a frontier beyond which you need molecules um, to replace heat, uh, to replace existing uh, gray hydrogen, um, to replace basically other end uses. Now, the ultimate end use for hydrogen that would be difficult to um, deploy would be to replace natural gas in its most efficient uses, right? I mean, mm -hmm. production of electricity in um, gas turbines being replaced by hydrogen, that would be economically probably the most challenging, the uh, most, the ultimate frontier for hydrogen. But in the meantime, a number of other uses, be it to replace gray hydrogen or be it to replace gray ammonia um, in heavy transport, for instance, um, are, are eminently uh, achievable from where we sit. There are clear obstacles that need to be overcome, uh, scaling up of electrolyzers, bringing down of electrolyzer prices, uh, gigafactories uh, being implemented and starting to deploy um, and supply electrolyzers at mass scale at more affordable prices. Uh, those still need to play out and those need to be tested, proven, etc. together with mass scale up of um, ammonia, green ammonia production and other molecule production and potentially cracking back of ammonia after transport uh, into hydrogen at scale. Uh, these are engineering issues that need to be addressed, but as engineering issues go, um, it's anticipated that those should be relatively straightforward mm -hmm. and overcomable. Um, it still needs to play out. And the fact that this is happening in the context of Supply chain disruptions and uh, hyperinflation doesn't help, but we are where we are and we still need to crack on with it. Yeah, and now I wanted to kind of move this conversation towards um, the financing and investing this momentum on uh, hydrogen. I know it's a, a, an expertise that you have at uh, Cranmore Partners. You launched last year the Hydrogen Investability Index towards uh, the end of 2021. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, this tool, this how the methodology that you guys use behind it um, and kind of explain uh, how the industry has been responding also to it and adopting this uh, key tool that could be extremely helpful. Sure. Um, I guess two different topics and I'd like to comment on both if that's okay. Financeability on the one yeah, hand and hydrogen index on the other. Let me just take hydrogen index. When we started going deep into uh, understanding the uh, green and blue hydrogen industry about three years ago. Uh, there was so much being published about it, but we didn't know where to start in relation to focusing our energies uh, for potential transactions. So which were the jurisdictions that were the most likely to lead to the greatest amount of activity? And then that automatically led to what matters in that regard. And we realized that it hadn't been published and we decided therefore to gift that thought process to the ecosystem to accelerate the, uh, the, the adoption and the debate. Uh, hence, we published the Hydrogen Investability Index after about six months of research. And I think uh, we focused on a few key anchor um, topics, right? Anchor criteria. Um, yeah. Regulation is really important. Investability in general is really mm -hmm. important. Enabling infrastructure being in a given uh, country uh, is important. 
existence of heavy industries that already use um, molecules that could be replaced by green molecules, uh, also important. Um, I mentioned as well uh, energy security as a bonus, uh, which we had identified as being potential enabler or accelerator. So uh, those were the key criteria. And of course, without forgetting, of course, access to um, low cost renewable resource at scale. Uh, because for green hydrogen, certainly that is the biggest component of the levelized costs of hydrogen, and therefore uh, that's a key enabler. So as a combination of that, uh, we looked into all countries and we published the top 40 or so countries. Uh, we are in the process of refreshing that. Hopefully uh, this helped uh, parties focus on which countries made the most sense. And we had, we had very positive feedback. We had suggestions in relation to adapting the, uh, the methodology, which is also great. We are not in the business of publishing indices. We simply did this yeah. to accelerate the debate and adoption, as we said, and we're really looking forward to the uh, refreshed um, new ranking, which will come up in the next few months, likely in September. Um, let me say a few words about financeability. Yes, financeability ahead, is please. really important because to achieve um, reasonable costs of hydrogen, uh, you need to be able to uh, access low cost capital and financing is lower cost than equity in broad terms, we can say that. Uh, so we need to make sure that we identify de-risking building blocks uh, to be able to enable uh, green hydrogen projects to, to attract low cost capital and most, most importantly financing. So. Um, mm. We had early on, about two and a half years ago, been part of an accelerated pla accelerator platform in Western Europe um, to identify and um, basically study the building blocks of bankability in terms of EPC mm. contracts, in terms of hydrogen purchase agreements, in terms of hydrogen transport agreements. Um, we provided bankability input into those, and then we've taken building blocks of notional projects um, around about two years ago and uh, started discussing with banks and uh, debt funds as well as credit rating agencies when they hadn't seen any projects yet other than maybe Neom Helios um, as well as uh, a particular smaller transaction in French Guiana which Hydrogen de France had put on the map. Um, so that really started the debate. What we've seen in that context is a lot of engagement, a lot of willingness to be constructive about it, uh, the importance of HPAs, the importance of understanding of a market, the enabling of liquidity in that market that could give comfort, which is really crucial. So the sooner yeah. we understand the market drivers and uh, we see a number of players being active there, the more comfortable the um, financiers will be. And, um, mm -hmm. and as part of that, hopefully um, achieving attractive financing terms. Um, we are currently active on a number of situations that are basically playing out, uh, slightly confidential. I can't talk too openly, but um, we're really looking forward to uh, other transactions or the first transactions closing. I mean, the two transactions I mentioned, one of them has closed and the other one is yeah. in the market at the moment. Uh, there will be others soon. Yeah. Okay. And investments towards um, technologies is the next topic I wanted to, to bring up. Towards, towards low carbon technologies? Are the investments there? Are investors starting to kind of ramp up the investments? What are your thoughts on uh, the, technical the technical aspect and is the expertise there in the region and then beyond maybe if you wanna to touch upon that? Sure, so the clean tech space has been going through a revival and uh, certainly in relation to um, hydrogen related technologies, uh, it's public information. Some companies are listed and doing very, very well. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, there has been understandably, so let's take the electrolyzer um, uh, manufacturers, there has been significant rush into building electrolyzer uh, technologies as well as building electrolyzer manufacturing capabilities. Uh, those are scaling up. Uh, they're still at early stages, uh, but they're all very well capitalized. Now, at the same time, um, quantitative easing is basically uh, tapering off. Um, mm -hmm. We anticipate that the um, energy transition arena, uh, as well as new technologies that 
have a clear path to um, provenness, for want of a better word, are likely to be still very defensive in that context and will not be that impacted by the change in sentiment. Will still be well capitalized. Valuations may normalize somewhat, but um, yeah, those will be well supported for sure. In terms of policy making, I wanted to uh, bring the topic of policies and policies as an enabler to um, establishing whether it's uh, waste to hydrogen plants, whether it's uh, developing infrastructure, uh, helping stakeholders, the industry um, to boost their hydrogen production. Where do you see the policies, particularly in the Middle East, the UAE, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, and the region in general, do you see? Do you think that the policies are there? Are they um, well enough established, or do we still need to see a lot um, of policies come up? In the sure, next it's of years? directionally in a constructive space, but mm -hmm. um, directionally, I don't think we're there. Um, let's think about Europe. Certainly, yeah. what Europe has going for itself is a clear. Um, carbon cap and trade scheme, uh, yeah. same for the UK, and that in itself creates the building blocks in terms of avoided uh, carbon price for the emitters yeah. to start um, rewarding um, the greenness of green hydrogen or yeah. clean hydrogen, let's say. Um, that is a bit absent in the Middle East for local consumption and therefore most of the schemes we see uh, in the region are for export and export typically into Europe, which has a very established carbon scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, that unavoidably focuses uh, mines on ammonia, which is the preferred vector for um, transport of hydrogen. It's anticipated that mass scale cracking of ammonia in specific ports in Northern Europe will be happening. Um, what we would say is, um, especially with carbon border adjustment mechanisms coming, um, initiatives to integrate and to adopt perhaps uh, carbon pricing will have to come to the fore. There are such initiatives we hear as well in, uh, in, yeah. in the Gulf, including UAE. Yeah. Uh, these need to take shape. Um, in parallel, there are initiatives as well to pierce the carbon border adjustment mechanism to produce uh, green molecules um, in compliance with the taxonomy, European taxonomy within the region um, to host new heavy industries, greenfield heavy industries uh, that could then export green products uh, into Europe. Uh, that is quite promising. In essence, you're replicating and you're extending the European, um, for want of a better word, regulation into those zones that could then uh, sell into Europe. Um, those are the areas which are very, very encouraging. And of course, uh, there are a few schemes in the Gulf, um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, yeah. uh, Abu Dhabi to some extent to, to capture some Sorry. of that. Uh, regulations therefore are directionally positive and hopefully mm -hmm. uh, they'll keep maturing. Yeah. I wanted also to touch upon this um, in, in line with kind of the, the policy making, but also uh, in terms of coordination and partnerships, whether it's partners, public-private partnerships, whether it's industry partnerships, um, this idea of also knowledge sharing. Uh, what do you, where do you see uh, stakeholders in the Middle East at? Is there enough of this uh, sharing of knowledge in terms of hydrogen development and either, even in broader um, net zero goals? Do you think that there's enough coordination happening between stakeholders or do you see that this also needs to ramp up in the upcoming months, especially ahead of COP27 that's happening in Egypt and COP28 and the UAE. We do see, yeah, we do see partnership approaches continuously in this space. I think yeah. uh, stakeholders are very keen to uh, share experience and co-develop. Uh, risks are significant because it's a massive scale transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, although the building blocks are simple enough, um, yeah. The realization, given the scale, given the supply chain, given imperatives of localization and sustainability um, need to be really addressed. Mm -hmm. um, that also means that counterparts are really appear to be really willing to work together yeah. between um, yeah, producers, uh, between uh, contractors, manufacturers, yeah. uh, transport um, and storage providers, as well as off takers. Mm -hmm. and at the same time investors. So yeah. um, we do see collaborations. We do see a lot of announcements as well. Um, ambitious uh, announcements, but it's exciting. Yeah. A lot of ambitious announcements. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're not involved in um, some, we're involved in others. We do see um, certainly a lot of bandwidth going into it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, as I was mentioning earlier on, um, implementation um, is bound to have challenges in the current environment for reasons I mentioned. Um, inflation, uh, supply chain, um, energy crisis, um, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, hopefully mm -hmm. uh, those will play out uh, positively in the coming months and years. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately, I need to keep my eye on the time and we're running out of time. So I wanted to get your closing comments. I always like to bring up, obviously, the event where everyone is looking towards COP27, COP28, super exciting time to be in the Middle East. Um, in terms of net zero goals and broader energy transition uh, ambitions, where do you see things going? What would be kind of your top two or top one um, thing you would like to see coming out of COP27 um, and then obviously COP28 in the UAE. Um, is there something in specific that you want to see stakeholders that are going to be there and government leaders and everyone focus on in terms of hydrogen or in terms of broader energy uh, transition goals? What would be your sure. top? Uh, a few, a few yeah. things, a few thoughts. Uh, firstly, uh, we need to relax a little bit about gas. Gas is a very efficient energy vector. Uh, it is way cleaner than a number of alternatives that are currently being consumed globally. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it is acutely needed in the interim uh, as part of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. So I think um, yeah, we, I think that the stakeholder universe globally is going to relax a little bit about gas and will mm -hmm. also be keener to exploit alternative gas resources. Uh, secondly, um, the stakeholders have been and will continue to be, and I hope they will continue to be, uh, supportive of uh, quicker energy transition, even if that means near-term pain in terms of costs. Uh, the sooner we um, absorb the pill, the quickly, the more quickly the, the costs are going. It's bound like, to happen. It's going to happen, right. whether it's now or in to, a year. That's right. And we need to... Uh, be ready for that and we need to embrace that and thirdly this is um, a bit of a niche topic but we all talk about uh, export of hydrogen via ammonia but uh, we start mm -hmm. need we start we need to start thinking about pipelines um, Europe is talking about that um, backbones but we need to start thinking about linking key regions uh, however far they may be uh, as starting with the nearer ones um, to link them to key consumption areas so mm -hmm. key producing regions as they are linked for natural gas need to be linked for hydrogen to the mm -hmm. key consumption areas so um, that is one topic that will take time that is more complex but it's necessary and once it's there it's for life yeah. uh, for forever for one yeah. time, as it yeah. were and uh, that is something that is worth some some focus yeah, I mean, on that wonderful insight, thank you so much, uh, Yusuf, for joining us and for joining this Hydrogen Full Court Press interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Please follow Crown More Partners and Yusuf to find out more about the fascinating world of hydrogen and follow us at Gulf Intelligent to listen more uh, to our weekly series. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Yusuf, for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.